Dude did well. Grant Lawrence, welcome to the show. One of the most Canadian dudes on the planet. I have to have you on here uh, to to talk all things Canada and and your world. How you been? What's been going on? Hey, thank you very much, Brenton, for having me. I appreciate the intro and uh, been busy. You know, just uh, got got through the holidays. Um, uh, January is usually my sick month, and uh, that's usually. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's just a kind of a look. My body just kind of collapses in a, in a heap of um, pain and, and everything just kind of like exits my body and, and my wife is used to it. And it's kind of just my, my employer's used to it. I just, uh, January is usually a rough month for me. It's usually dry month you know, all those things. It's a recovery month, basically. Jan I mean, January for a lot of people is is that that sort of starting over month, which is interesting because yeah. a lot of episodes that I'll do around this time focus on, you know, not necessarily resolutions, but it's it's like, how is the year? People are making changes or, or whatever. So I totally understand it, man. And it's yeah. uh, a little harder to get out of bed when it's minus 20 like today. Yeah, today I walked. Um, I th I have two little kids, and I layered. My wife is a musician; she's on tour right now in the states, and so I'm solo parenting. And I bundled my kids up, layered them up fully, yeah. and then uh, I went out and walked the dog and almost froze my ass off. My thumbs, <laughs> like I, I, they, I swear, I was like, oh my god, I'm getting frostbite on my thumbs, and I wasn't wearing, I wasn't wearing very good mittens, so I blame myself anyway. But I was texting my hockey buddies saying, okay, are we on uh, Rice Lake watch here, guys, or what? You know, because uh, a couple of years ago, Rice Lake froze in weather like this, beautiful, oh. sunny, cold weather, and we were up there skating and playing shinny for days, right on. Uh, christmas week like we were up there new year's like right in that between christmas and new year's and on uh i remember on new year's eve we were skating on trout lake and it was absolutely spectacular well it's i bet we're only going to get it like and for anyone listening or watching uh, uh, <laughs> vancouver never really gets like this we'll get the no. occasional we'll get the occasional blast but it yeah it cold was like snap. super cold this morning like you know i took my kid to hockey practice at 5 a.m and, I, and he, he comes out and he's like what and i'm like start singing a national anthem pal this is how you do it this is the the this is how you make the make the nhl uh you got to make that 5 a.m uh, how minus, old is minus, your he's kid? 13 he's 13 oh, so so he's in yeah. u15 yeah he is yeah he's in u15 which yeah my son's in u11 he just um it's uh, i had him on a trajectory to uh, like I started him basic, but we didn't, he's just playing house league for the first time right oh, now, cool. which uh, as a Canadian p dad or parent, I, I know that's blasphemy to say, but he did a lot of independent sports before that. So I had him in that little power play league that like the city of Surrey does here, which is like, you know, red shirt versus green shirt. And then I had this right. trajectory for him that I was like, Hey, I'll, maybe I'll put him in the house league. Um, you know, when he's like 10 or something or nine, but then that COVID hit and then he, you know, that shut the whole program down. So I had to kind of restart him yeah. to get his feet going. And uh, so I did another year of that. And then this is his first year in house league and he's 13, but he's playing with 15 year old kids that have been playing since they were four. So <laughs> How, how's he doing? You know what? Scored his first goal uh, and the jubilation on the, on his, on his, um, a part like his teammates face yeah was just as big as his yeah because well they I know he's the new kid it's amazing it was amazing i'm a i i coach um minor hockey yeah and i i don't think you're ever too old to start and i think it's a bad attitude to think that when parents think oh you are too old to start i don't think yeah. you're ever too old to start the game is for everybody it's a Beautiful, fun. Um, it's all supposed to be about fun, especially house league, and um, and that's what I coach. And we have uh, like my kid has played since he was like he's been in skates since he was two. Yeah. But there are kids that just sign up and they're welcome on the team, and uh, sometimes they pick it up really fast, and sometimes they look like a waddling duck. But the 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 
thing that, that's amazing about hockey is that the game teaches. You know, coaches can do whatever, totally. but it's the game that teaches. And it's just playing the game is how you learn the game. You know, like you learn it pretty quickly. Like uh, some of the kids, the I noticed the biggest thing um, is offsides. Like that's the hardest thing for a kid who's yeah. thrown into hockey to figure out offsides. And, but with every kid on the ice and the referees yelling, you're yeah. offside. You're offside. You're they offside. figure it out pretty quickly. They, they're like, what, 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 His, where, where's uh, this? I was, my biggest fear with this is, uh, um, with him going in late, just from a personal side is because I started hockey late. I started hockey very, very late. I, I, I played pickup my whole life, but not until I moved to Vancouver in 05, I was like 28. I actually put on a uniform for the first time. Well, I'm basically, on, the, I'm basically played on a men's way. team. So yeah. I'm like, my feet were, were fine, but nowhere near where they are now, which is still not amazing. But he, he him coming in, uh, at, you know, at that level with these kids that like, you know, you put four of the best kids from his team against my men's team and they're, they're taking us out. It's like Same. some of them, some of them should have been on, on a, a already trajectory for UBC hockey or something, but Same. he's been, he's picked it up so fast and the group has been so supportive. I, mm -hmm. I'm just like ecstatic. Yeah. You know, yeah I'm, no, it's I'm ecstatic. Great, it's, at, it's a great at, community. And the, the cool thing, it's a very good time for minor hockey because, um, there was a lot of systematic problems in hockey for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, you could call it the Don Cherry syndrome. You could call it, uh, you know, machismo, whatever you want to call it. And, and hockey Canada has in a way um, like overcorrected to the point where it's like sunshine and lollipops mm. at, at hockey now. And if you raise your voice or if you, um, do anything untoward it's extremely frowned upon which i ultimately think is a good thing because i actually got bullied out of hockey at an early age and bullying and i got bullied out of hockey by our team captain uh, <laughs> which was a brutal irony and he went on to be uh, drafted by the winnipeg jets yada yada you know now and and so uh i i i, li I like how um, how much peace, love, and understanding there is in minor hockey right now. I think there needs to be more in um, Little League Baseball. I think Little League Baseball is what needs correcting now. Yeah. Uh, but hockey is great. And House League is awesome too because you can get some very, very, very good players in House League that don't want to commit to the insane schedule of rep hockey for kids. You know, <laughs> that was awesome. There was no way. Yeah. So like there's, there's no kids way. on there. Now my son isn't, I don't think he would make rep and he's fine with that, but there's kids where I am coaching them going saying to the parents, like this, your kid is unbelievable. Like, did you try him out for rep? And they're like, we don't want to be at a rink five, six days a week. No way. So I'm like, all right, great. Well, it's to our, our team's called the hot dogs and it's to the hot dogs benefit. And, you know, uh, we've got some really, really great kids, great players, but I'm not sure if you wanted to start this conversation on minor hockey, but uh, listen to me. I'm, I, every single one of these episodes is supposed to teach people about, about people and about things. And for anyone not living in Canada and our passion for hockey, which is not just falling on Canadians, obviously, yeah. but, uh, but just the fact that it brings so many people together, no different, you know, I, you, you toured, I tour for a living. You know, me being on a tour bus with a bunch of Americans talking college football on a Saturday. You know, I I can tell you, you know, the third line of a lot of players in on, on, on a lot of NHL teams. I couldn't tell you, even though I like football, I couldn't tell you what each individual position of a football team does. No, in, this, in the same way. But I but I liken this to to the same kind of conversation. So I'll start the conversation any way we want, because ultimately we're here to teach people about life now aren't we so it's good absolutely and i really appreciate you making the time uh especially when you're balancing uh a touring wife and and uh, and solo dad and so you still made the the time to uh to come on today so i appreciate it thank you yeah my pleasure
It's um, it's great. So you're doing a lot of things. So there's a lot of history. We got mutual friends we've never met, but I uh, we follow each other on, on a few things, and that's that's been great. And I always like following uh, uh, what what you've been up to. I've done some shows with your wife before, which is cool. Um, but I but I just you know I'm I'm always fascinated with the journey of people and, and the story of people, which is why I named this podcast as such. Uh, so why don't we dive into the nuts and bolts here for a minute and um, tell me and tell everybody what you do grant so my job is uh i guess my title would be music journalist and for the last oh boy 20 25 26 27 years i've worked at the cbc the canadian broadcasting corporation and i uh, basically mostly doing music uh i specialize in canadian music yeah, there I am. <laughs> and I kind of have been become known as this guy that kind of really, I, you know, I grew up with the CBC. I grew up with Mr. Dress Up. I grew up absolutely with, you know, uh, that lineup that, that would babysit us in the morning, you know, Friendly Giant and Mr. Dress Up and then into the American Sesame Street. And, and then I also grew up with the Beachcombers on Sunday evenings and the wonderful world of Disney that was on beforehand. And so I, I had a lot of nostalgia for uh, certainly CBC television. And I had this weird moment when I was a little kid uh, where they still do this sometimes. They'll take a class on a field trip to the CBC. So when I was in like grade two or three, I went to CBC Vancouver on a field trip. And we, we were right at the end of the field trip and the, the guide of the field trip, we're in the lobby of CBC Vancouver. I'm seven years old. And the guy says, Oh, look, kids, look, there's one of the stars of the beachcombers. And this tall man is striding through the lobby. And, uh, the, the, the guy, this guy says, hi kids. He stops and chats and he says, who can tell me, who I am on the beachcombers and yeah. I'm this little nerdy kid at the back and I stick up my hand and he points to me and says, yeah, you. And I said, you're a constable, constable, the police officer uh, from the beachcombers, uh, beachcombers. He goes, you are right. What's your name? And I said, my name's Grant. And he goes, well, Grant, you might just have a future at this place. I kid you not. <laughs> and so that's when I was seven and then when I was around, oh, I don't know, late 20s or something like that, 27, 28, somewhere around there, I ended up getting a job. And it wasn't a dream job. It was kind of what I thought was a stopgap because I was in the Smugglers. I was working at Mint Records. But there was a big downswing in the music industry around 1998. And Mint Records basically said to me, I'm not, the, the, Randy and Bill were like, we got to tighten the belts here. We're not sure if we can really pay you like we have been. Wow. So you might have to look for something else. So I contacted a couple of friends at the CBC and said, hey, are there any anything available? And there happened to be a researcher's job available, which at the time was the lowest uh, position available at the CBC. And you, you go in and you... You basically you find out who's the guests on whatever show you're working on and you research them and you provide notes for the host. So that was my first ever job at the CBC. I thought it was going to be temporary. I signed a three month contract. I thought that, you know, music industry will swing back around, um, which it eventually did like a year or two later. There was a big boom in the year 2000, but it took a couple of years in 98 distributors were going broke and, it was kind of a boom bust echo of grunge and punk. Yeah. Uh, and, and so um, there was a lull and in that lull, I got a job at the CBC and I'm still there. And I currently, my current gig is that I host the CBC music top 20, which is the most mainstream thing that I do and that I've ever done at the CBC. Yeah. So, you know, we'll be playing, I think on the chart, right now there's a beyonce song and uh that's 
pretty mainstream for me. You know, I'm I'm a guy who comes from a punk rock background, and you know, I won't lie. Sometimes I got to call up my uh, my 15 year old nephew and say, "So how? So it's pronounced Beyonce, but uh, <laughs> not quite like that. But sometimes, and uh, but yeah. So uh, I've had this long trajectory trajectory in music um but i my break from music is usually in writing where i uh, have over the last 12 or 14 years um become an author so i've written about uh wilderness places like desolation sound i've written children's books i'm writing a new children's book now so that's kind of my life in a nutshell. I'm I'm married to a musician, Jill Barber, and yeah. we have two kids, age uh, ten and seven. So that that's pretty much life as it is right now for for me. I'm 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 retired from the live music circuit. I don't tour that anymore. I do a different type of show. I tour a I, uh, it's me rocking out at the Commodore at the Smugglers reunion. But now I tour a show that is a little bit more uh, age appropriate, mm. and I involve my books. So I do ah, this cool. th this show called um, Grant Lawrence and Friends: An Evening of Stories and Songs, and I bring my musician buddies out to play, usually acoustically or solo, yeah. and then I tell my stories or read stories in between those performances that's great and i saw you're doing like bone out you're doing all the kind of the area out here um yeah. and, and keeping that beachcomber theme rolling that's right uh, and hitting all the spots i'm a uh, i think you're talking about jackson davis so we pulled yeah. him up just there for he this. is there he is and we're buddies now i was able so you, you, you mentioned fairies i yeah. i ran into him on a bc ferry of course uh, where I spend like 70% of my life, it feels like, but I ran into him and I, and I was able to tell him the story that I told you. <laughs> and he, and he said, well, I know, I, I know of you, I hear you on the radio. And I said, well, that's, I, I feel like you were the prophet uh, when it comes to my career at the CBC. So we have remained friends ever since. And occasionally I will do some bit with him. Like I'll bring him onto my segment yeah. on CBC television or uh, like I'll get him to do a walk on or I'll do a, a live thing with him. And he's, he's still uh, extremely funny and very, very quick and a great actor and, and a really, really great guy. I, I mean, we all, I mean, I'm, pushing fit almost 50 so it's it's one of those things where we, we came through that space as well cbc was so important you you hit it on the head with the you know disney starting and then the beachcombers and yeah danger bay we had all these kind yeah, of really cool right. shows that were so canadian that we got made fun of for a lot but it's it's pretty incredible how how it's moved around the world like kevin smith loved the grassy mm -hmm. and has put all these degrassi references into his into his uh you know, movies and stuff. And it's just such yeah, an interesting I mean, thing, you know? I think that Conan O'Brien even slipped in a mention of the beachcombers on one of the Simpsons episodes. Wow. He wrote in I, it wouldn't surprise Lisa me. mentioning the beachcombers or something like that, you know? So yeah, it. I mean, you know, the beachcombers was a half hour show with the simplest of pitches <laughs> It, which basically corner gas ripped off totally. They just put it on the prairies, Yeah. but it was like Greek guy and his first nations buddy collect stray logs that yeah. have broken off of booms and they collect them and then cash in on them. And that's it. And it lasted for almost 20 years. And it was, you know, kind of like, it was kind of like Shit's Creek before Shit's Creek. It was, you know, syndicated all over the world. And and is still a very popular show, but unfortunately, it's all there's a quagmire around the rights and mm. and all the payments that would be involved in in uh, putting all those episodes up. But CBC in to mark the 50th anniversary of the debut episode, uh, yeah. So the day I think the debut was 1973. 
Um, wow. What they did was they put up, I think, five episodes on CBC Gem from throughout the 19-year run of the Beachcombers. So, but yeah, um, it's an iconic I, show. I was thinking about it the other day, actually. As we as Canadians do, we all think about Beachcombers at least once a month. Um, yeah. But I, I was thinking uh, of how, when I was a kid, uh, and on the show you've got to have a bad guy right or yeah at least that and that was relic and and yeah. it's and i know we're getting we're diving deep here but the funny thing is is like when you look back on like on youtube or see some of those highlights it's like he was just an angry old guy <laughs> he yeah wasn't, and he was he also, wasn't an evil he wasn't the dr evil <laughs> i mean just, and the but he was he was quite the scallywag and yeah. he was always trying to find the angle I'm and he was so always funny. trying to rip off the other guys but um he was basically he was yeah he was an oscar the grouch type guy but the amazing he had the coolest jet boat of all time that could do like the, the crazy thing about the beachcombers is they were pulling off all these like boat stunts it was like yeah. dukes of hazard on the water, on the water yeah. nobody else in the entire world was doing what they were doing with boats this was a decade before miami vice and those crazy cigarette boats down in florida this this was like they broke all sorts of stunt molds on that show with what they did with water and boats doing huge jumps and crazy, crazy stunts. And of course, the other thing about Relic is he was like basically the original West Coast hipster. Like <laughs> you walk into any Definitely. restaurant or bar or brewery in Vancouver now and you look around and it's like there's like 40 Relic clones there's the the little blue toque that yeah. sits on top of people's heads. There's a little <laughs> bit of scrub here. There's um, you know, there's like a Mac jacket. Uh, the pants are rolled up, showing like some dirty Converse sneakers. And like, it's relic. Like this is the relic look. It's like requiem for a relic everywhere. Uh, in fact, I think yeah. I, I I may even be quoting myself because I think I did an article along those lines for for some whistler magazine about and the funny thing is is that the uh the the hipsters you're speaking about at those at those breweries are just as pissed off <laughs> they're so just, just as grumpy as, just as grumpy as relic yeah, <laughs> yeah. the uh i the, i mean you're that you've been there for so long and i mean you have the uh the you know probably access to I don't know if you get access to, to old CBC not shows. So if you get, much. Not it's so much. It's pretty hard but... to, to get access to a lot of the stuff. You know, they're they're in archives, but the but us regular kind of CBC daily folks, yeah. it's pretty hard to access a lot of a lot of the older stuff. Uh, you have to go through all sorts of requests. I mean, I have made an absolute mountain of of content at the CBC over the years, both television, video, digital podcast, everything. And a lot of that stuff just, it's just, it's gone, you know, like it, yeah. it, it vaporizes mostly due to rights issues, things like that. Um, and it's kind of crazy because like, you know, the body of work is, is radio is fleeting. That's, that's one of the things I've learned. Absolutely. And, and, you know, like with, say, for instance, the, I don't know, I'm going to use an example like television. Like you can watch, I think, every episode of, of Cheers if you want to. Mm -hmm. But at, at, you can't watch or you can't listen to every CBC Radio 3 podcast that I ever did because there's rights issues with the music, unfortunately. So as eh, radio, it's, it's touchy with music on podcasts. I, I never use it. Oh cause, yeah. Uh, Cause I, I just, I would love to, I would love to do something with music, but it's just, you know, it gets shut down. Cause I do this on video and YouTube but it's, uh, it's just a bit of a, a tougher one, but is the CBC underappreciated, especially with the new, the new generation that has no clue what it actually, the impact that it had. On well, I I'm, them. I'm biased about that, but sure. uh, of course I do think so. I mean, I think, um, on kind of a serious note, uh, the CBC took, uh, quite a, quite a major, uh, hit, probably the most significant hit, um, say on a backlash level during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, because the CBC put 
the news out there that uh, of what was happening and uh, and and I believe it was based in in truth and fact and um, do on a completely personal level do I think sometimes the news was too heavy like every half hour on the hour yeah and I even found myself going like I need a break from this yeah. during that that period and I I I was actually thinking about this today I was thinking about some of our newscasters and news readers and how difficult that time must have been for them to have to report this stuff like every half hour and every hour but um i do of course think the cbc is underappreciated i think that uh you know from the entire time that i've worked at the cbc the mandate has always been at least for for the units i've worked in um get a younger audience and get a more diverse audience and it's been the same for like 30 years but we did get that eventually with um, CBC Radio 3, which was a unit that uh, specialized in Canadian music and music culture. And it was a really amazing, incredibly creative unit to work in uh, that started podcasts at the CBC. And uh, and just we had a satellite radio station. We did um online radio we did terrestrial we did everything uh, we did a tv videos and we just uh, uh, the whole point of it was to build up canadian music and canadian musicians and and that was when we did have the uh the youth audience and we had the university students and we from all over the world and unfortunately radio three is pretty much it's it's yeah. morphed into the larger CBC Music now, gotcha. which is a much broader platform that encompasses everything, and not so niche as CBC Radio Three. But um, but yeah, so that's the, the youth audience, pretty much exactly the audience that our buddy Nardwar has. Yeah, that's exactly the audience that the CBC is always trying to reach. It's interesting to to me on uh, on that because I just think it's such an integral part to the country's identity, and I know people will will fight me on that because whatever Canadian uh, television or broadcasting has always t taken a bit of a at least our our TV shows. That obviously, they got the big Hollywood production kind of level stuff now, but there was a certain charm to you know Fred Penner walking out of a log. Yeah, yeah, and and I you know and just that moment. Uh, that of of amazement as a kid and and now it's it's news and you have gem and you have options and and we're just so inundated with with content that uh, I just feel like it's getting lost in the shuffle as all the conglomerates fight amongst each other to, to fire everybody it's and, it's the know. most competitive landscape that's ever existed for media I mean that that's yeah. no question and but it's the most competitive landscape for anyone that's in in any form of media or entertainment yeah. because there's so many options and there's so many i mean you know i think i remember when i when radio 3 first launched um we were on Sirius satellite radio which eventually yeah. morphed into Sirius XM and that is a subscription-based satellite radio thing that really took off in the States, thanks mostly to, I would say, Howard Stern, mm -hmm. um, but never really caught on in the zeitgeist in Canada as much. But it's been successful. It's been around for now 20 years. But I remember some a very notable CBC personality who I – I won't mention because I don't want to embarrass them. But when we started doing satellite radio, this was 20 years ago, that person said to me, this is subscription. This is, this is so old school. No one is, no one's going to buy into a subscription. No one's, mm. no one's doing subscriptions anymore. What is this time magazine? <laughs> yeah, Reader's right. digest. But now look the, look what we have. Everything is subscription based. In okay. fact, I think most of us have a hard time keeping track of what we're subscribed to. And, you know, like I sometimes I'll say to my wife, hey, what's the uh, whatever the password for Crave? 
and she'll give me a password. I'm like, oh no, are you subscribed work. to Crave? And she'll say, yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm subscribed. So they were like double, and like yeah. we got to go through all these subscriptions mm. and make sure it's like we're it's crazy, right? So, um, so it we do live in a subscription based culture and it's everywhere like everywhere you look like you know subscribe to my podcast uh, you know follow me on this do this do that do this it's, it's like that's the world that we live in and the cbc is an institution but it's right in the thick of that and trying to keep up and trying to stay relevant but i you know here's what i always here's what i always say when the chips are down and things in this country are maybe going sideways or or something is going down i think and maybe i'm completely biased and naive about this but i think the majority of canadians no matter where their beliefs lie yeah. will turn to the cbc to get the goods of what is going on either in their community or in their city or in their province or in their country. And because it is dependable and it's always been there and hopefully it will always be there. And if you turn it on, you know, like, like last night we had a, you know, two centimeters of snow and the city went, crazy in vancouver like yep. the whole city I was in it i was down there it <laughs> just shut down and it was like ice everywhere but you know you could turn on whatever like lots of radio stations obviously covering it but you could get cbc and you could know exactly where the pileups are where this where that and it sounded like you know it sounds like familiar people like mm -hmm. us yeah talking about what's happening out there and so i hope that that sort of dependability will always be remembered and that and that yes i hope to 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 address your original point i think is that i hope that the cbc is not taken for granted well, there's just too many important moments that to your point like we would we would go to them for you know the information and uh, uh i just I, I i think it's a wonderful place and and people can fight me on it all day long, but I think it's, you know, it's such a big part of well, thanks my youth, my youth growing up. I think it's wonderful. Um, so you mentioned the books and the smugglers and there's, there's a few mm -hmm. things. So we'll die. Let's, let's go to like, how did you do it? Uh, you covered a little bit of it already as far as your, your entry into CBC and into that space. So let's go to, um, uh, the reissue, uh, sorry, becoming an author, which I, I'm, I always admire and being, and get in putting these, these books out. Um, some of it ties into your road life and and you know with dirty windshields and and touring so let's go see see if you can connect these dots here of okay. of uh the reissue of the smugglers um uh, uh, anniversary and yeah. then you had you know some shows that you played you're not touring anymore but you write the books you write a kid's book how does all that come together because i'm fascinated by becoming an author i don't know well I, yeah. I you know i've always written and i've always kind of been a chronicler um you know like my parents i, I give my parents a lot of credit because way and, and I, I gotta do it with my kids this this season too but way back when um my parents used to force me to write thank you notes for birthday or Christmas gifts. And I just, uh, I got to make my kids do it too. I've forgotten about it and they'll hate it. And, but, <laughs> um, but so I, I had to sit down and I remember I had to fill like one side of a page or whatever. And I remember disliking it so intensely, uh, sort of holding my, I was so annoyed with my parents that they would make me do this, that I would write stories in the thank you note, uh, uh, like embarrassing around the house stories about my parents or my sister. So I'd be like, dear aunt Donna uh, and uncle Gord, thank you very much for the Richard scary books. Did you know that 
my dad farts at the dinner table after he finishes eating very <laughs> loudly. And, you know, and I'd write all this stuff out of the stuff I thought was funny. And then I would fold it up or I would show my parents from a distance, look, I've written it. And they'd say, okay, fold it up, put it in the envelope. And then it would just get mailed off. And then my relatives would receive it and they would read these notes. And uh, a couple of the relatives were offended. And they're like, do you have any idea what your kids are saying about you? <laughs> but my aunt, Donna, was used to be a journalist. And she lives in New York City. And she thought the stories were funny and well-written. So that was my first ever feedback on writing. And she would say to my parents, you know, he's a pretty good writer. He's got a, he's, he's like eight years old and he's kind of writing jokes and stuff. And then, so Donna switched right then from sending me toys to sending me really good curated books. Uh, as some of the books she sent me over the years include things like Grapes of Wrath and, uh, you know, like, uh, oh, there was one, um, like White Fang, uh, adventure books, basically. Um, you know, and then when I got a little older, like Catcher in the Rye or Lord of the Flies and stuff like that. And, uh, and I, like, I, I love them and I love the, uh, the nature of the adventures and the stories. And so I give, my parents credit for forcing me to write those thank you notes and my aunt Donna for sending me all these amazing books. So then there was one other key moment when I wanted to form a rock band and that horrified my dad who was very conservative and he was a self-made guy. Uh, he's, he really cares about money and he came from a somewhat humble background and made his fortune, all that kind of stuff. And he said, well, look, the, no one ever makes money in music. And he said something along the lines of, if you insist on flushing your life down <laughs> the black hole toilet that is the music industry, you have to make me a promise. And I said, okay, what's the promise? And I thought it was going to be like, you can never ask me for money or something like that. But the promise was, you have to write the misery down. And I wow. said, well, what do, you, what do you mean? He goes, you, after every show, you have to write a report. You have to write a, a diary of, of every gig that you play in the smugglers. So I thought, well, if that'll get you off my back, um, because he hated, hated, hated the idea of me forming a band, then okay, uh, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll take that deal. And so from the very first smugglers show, which was way back in 1988 and when I was like 15 or 16, that night, I still have it, I came home and I wrote a page of what the show was like. And I started keeping them in like a wow. little album. And, and so, and I continued that throughout the entire very long run of the smugglers, like 15 years or something like that. And that became what I thought was going to be my first book. I'm like, well, I've got all these tour diaries from all these smuggler shows and I'll make this my first book because I always knew I wanted to write a book. And then the smugglers had kind of wound down. We were at around year 15, 16, year 17, something like that. And our guitarist threw in the towel, which he repeatedly tries to do. Somebody is at my house. Can I um, go ahead? Answer the door. It's uh, fine. Yeah. I've got a dog here too, but he's sleeping. He um, likes to keep watch while I'm doing these. I think it's okay. I think they've gone away, whatever no it was. <laughs> anyway, um, so we're, we're, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Band is like basically dying. Yeah. And I was. I, and I, I'm like, okay, so I've got these 15 years of tour stories, or whatever, tour diaries written. And, but then I was like staring at them all and I just felt burnt out. I felt burnt out on music. I felt burnt out on rock and roll. I was working at the CBC at the time. So I'm working music every day. I'm writing scripts. I'm talking about music. I'm doing all this stuff. And I just felt so burnt out on music. 
And because the band had wound down, I started going back to where this place where my family has always had a, a cabin called Desolation Sound, which is a place up the coast. Yeah. Road access, uh, no road access, boat access only, uh, wilderness, totally off the grid. And totally opposite to the life I had been leading, which was, you know, downtown cities, playing clubs, painted black, that smelled like urinal pucks. Uh, you know, and in, in like New York and Toronto and London and Tokyo, like all over the place. Uh, but I was, I, I went up to this oceanic paradise that I hadn't been to in 10 or 12 years and had totally forsaken. And I'm like, wow, this is so beautiful. I can't believe how different this is from, you know, CBGB or whatever. This is awesome. And I didn't really like Desolation Sound that much when I was a little kid, when I was forced to go there. But I started realizing that once the band wound down, I started spending more and more and more time there, that there was all these people and amazing end of the road characters up there. And I thought, wait a second, maybe I could write about this. Maybe this could feed my writer's itch. And so I started writing around 2005 and by around 2008 or so, my first book adventures in solitude was finished. And I through an incredible trial and error ended up um, eventually finding a publisher. And that was not through, here, I'm just going to let my dog into this office. I hear. Come on, Woody. Hi, um, the, the getting a publisher was a major feat and I got turned down by everyone in the country and yeah. internationally as well. And actually through um, music and beer league hockey, I got my publishing cool. deal. There it is. Uh, I was at a, I was at a show uh, by a band called Elliot brood. Yeah. And backstage we were, I'm friends with the guys. And so I was backstage and, and, um, there was this other guy backstage and he, and he says like, Hey, it's me. It's Silas. I play hockey with you. Um, you know, I'm on the, he said his team, the hockey lads, yeah. Winnie. And, uh, I said, Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and he said, so what have you been up to lately? I said, well, I've spent the last few years writing a book. Uh, and he goes, Oh yeah. About the smugglers. I said, no, it's about <laughs> this like, wilderness place that nobody's ever heard of called desolation sound on the north sunshine coast and i've sent it to all the publishers and i've either been ignored or uh rejected and he said well have you sent it to harbor publishing which is on the sunshine coast I said yeah it was probably one of the first ones i sent it to and he goes huh and it's about desolation sound i said yeah and he goes well and then he said the this guy Silas said the words that basically changed my life. He said, well, my dad owns Harbor Publishing. This is backstage <laughs> at Richards on Richards. What year was uh, that? Sorry. Oh, God. 2009? That was probably, I, I got to tell you, dude, that was probably my show. Because really? I, I did a whole bunch of Elliot Brood shows. And there was a run where I had like Luke and Melissa, like I had Luke Doucette in, I had oh, yeah. like Elliot Brood, early Arkells. So I did a there ton of Richard shows between there. So, so I got to tell you, I I think, and I'd have to look through the archives, but I'm pretty sure that was my show. Yeah. It'd be like very mm -hmm. close to when the venue would be like closing. Yeah. For good. Yep. Um, that's hilarious. That uh, weird, Small. weird coincidence. So, yep. so then Silas said that and, and I, I, you know, you're, you're backstage at Richard's drinking. You're just like chatting away, whatever, um, distracted. And so, uh, you know, we all go our separate ways and I kind of just forgot about it really. And mm -hmm. then like two weeks later, I get a email from Howard White, who is Silas's dad, <laughs> Howard White, like order of Canada, owner of Harbor publishing for, you know, now 50 years. And he said, look, my son told me you've written this, this book about uh, Desolation Sound. I found the manuscript. It was at the bottom of, of a pile. And uh, I read it, 
and we'll put it out. And Amazing. if if you write another 20,000 words. And I thought that, um, that that was because he loved it so much. He wanted more material. <laughs> but what it turned out to be was it was purely economical. Like I needed to get to a literally a certain thickness to to hit some price point like gotcha. 27.95 or something like that so i'm like oh my god like i can't believe it uh it's and and it, you know it's like that old life lesson of it's who you know mm -hmm. so because i played beer league hockey with silas white and i knew him from hockey i ended up finally getting a publishing deal but not through any official channels and it was only because we were both fans of elliot brood that we even came together at that point so you know life is strange and then so adventures in solitude came out in 2010 everyone had incredibly low expectations for it in fact i think the first run was was very low uh because the thinking was well all the publishers rejected this right nobody's ever heard of desolation sound blah 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 and i got to tell you brenton it it is to this day like i'm like behind me here there's a bunch of smugglers records yeah. but to this day that adventures in solitude book is the most successful piece of art i've ever put out into the world or product or whatever you want to call it uh, it has legs like that still go to this day, um, 14 years later. Uh, it It is the most life-altering thing. I mean, the band was awesome. Mm -hmm. CBC is awesome. But that book, that one book, just changed everything. Like it, it went, it, I, it surprised everybody, including myself. It went to number one. Uh, right away in BC and stayed there for an entire year. It was, went to number two on the um, national bestsellers list, bested only by Theo Fleury's amazing hockey book, Playing With Fire, yeah. which I think is one of the greatest hockey books ever written. I eventually became friends with Theo. Unfortunately, I still consider us friends. He no longer considers me friends because I teased him too much during the pandemic because he went full uh, freedom trucker. Oh, yeah. And I would tease him. Mm -hmm. I would call him out mm -hmm. all the time. You know, he'd say, hey, there's a million people uh, in trucks gathering in Ottawa this weekend. You got to go. And then there'd be, you know, whatever, a couple thousand. And I'd say, oh, Theo, uh, you might want to be accountable that a million people didn't show up and it'd be just like Whoa. that's funny <laughs> because, so because if you weren't on the cbc with a voice maybe he would have kept you as a friend but because he maybe, because you maybe. had the, you had a platform maybe it was like wait a minute, wait a minute. I get, like, yeah I so it's too bad uh, you know he he kind of went off the rails a bit there i still have a i still have a lot of respect for him he's gone through like absolutely crazy trauma and he's won everything you know mm -hmm. he's won stanley cup he's won the, the Olympic gold medal. He's won the juniors. I, he's an incredible competitor and an incredible athlete. Uh, he's dealt with a lot of trauma and I think it's pushed him a little bit off the brink, but um, anyway, so he bested me on the, the bestsellers list, which was, I thought was cool, but yeah. So the, and that book has just pretty much propelled my literary career um ever since so same publisher uh, you, you, you still use Harbor? Same, same publisher i've stuck with harbor Amazing. publishing um the whole time there's a the the rock and roll book um dirty windshields is on douglas and mcintyre but it is part of harbor publishing so I'm, and then you know like that return to solitude book that's on the screen right now that is uh that is like a sequel that came out i guess a year or two ago and it it two did a lot of the numbers that adventures in solitude did so and over the years like i i mentioned this in my latest newsletter um over the years that adventures in solitude book has been uh what's called optioned in the business many 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 times so it's like we're going to turn it into a tv show we're going to turn it into a movie we're going to turn it into a series this that the other thing 
And the latest, nothing ever has come of it, but the latest one was some excerpt was printed in Cottage Life magazine. And uh, a Hollywood director uh, on summer break in, uh, where, what's that? Muskoka yep. was reading it at his cottage. And he's like, oh, this would make a really good movie. And he his assistant contacted wow. me, this Hollywood director guy and set up a meeting. And so I had a meeting with this guy and he was just like Mr. Hollywood and he's slinging and he starts <laughs> slinging, dropping names. He's like, I see uh, Liam Neeson as the Hobbit. I'm uh, sorry, not the Hobbit. <laughs> Not the Hobbit, the Hermit. As, as Relic. <laughs> as, as, yeah, as the Relic character, as Russell the Hermit. I see Liam Neeson playing this role. I'm like, Liam Neeson? And the director is like, L believe me, Liam Neeson will do anything these days. I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> and then he said, um, I see Finn Wolfhard from Stranger Jeez. Things just playing a young you uh, at the adolescent stage. I'm like, well, this guy's certainly dropping names. He goes and he. I said, so what happens? He goes, well, I want you to write the screenplay. And he goes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the treatment of how the, I want the story to go. I'm going to send it to you, and then you write the screenplay based on my treatment. And um, this is probably like self sabotage, but um, he sent me his treatment, and it was like the what I write is nonfiction. Like right. like the, these are stories that have actually happened like russell the hermit is a real person who i knew as a kid all the way through adulthood until the day he died and the treatment this director sent me was that i had a brother i have a sister i have a brother who like drowns at desolation sound which impacted me the rest of my life i meet this hermit who pulls me out of my um depression and then we go on like a kind of paper moon bonnie and clyde <laughs> um crime spree right. and we go robbing banks and stores and hotels up and down the sunshine coast and I'm like what the what is this yeah. and you know it's it reminded me of that that movie the player uh which was like a satire on hollywood um and I don't know if you remember it, but at the very beginning, two really earnest writers come into the producer's office and pitch this like art house, beautiful, slow paced mm -hmm. kind of romance type movie. And by the end of the movie at the premiere, it stars Bruce Willis and it's just machine guns and explosions everywhere. And the two writers are sitting there staring at the screen, even though it was like so far beyond what they, what they had pitched originally. But then, so the self-sabotage part is I was so put off by his treatment that I never wrote him or his assistant back so there goes my hollywood career. no that doesn't go your hollywood career but maybe they would have uh if they would have uh cast and uh, this guy <laughs> then uh, maybe jack yeah. davies uh, would have got it made and you can still make it in canada it's a canadian story maybe. anyways but um maybe. so th that being said we got a, a few minutes here but um oh uh, you know you're writing again you mentioned so what will you do next what's the what's your plan here well, that's the thing is like the legs of like what it, it I mean, sometimes you got to go with your muse and sometimes you got to go with like what people want. And so when it comes to my books, you know, I've written two books about Desolation Sound, which have been by far my most mm -hmm. successful books. As I said, the most successful stuff I've ever put out in the world, uh, you know, records and everything, those, those and then second most successful is would be lonely under the rink and then the smugglers book is kind of further down the list and even though i think the smugglers one is closest to my heart and i so when i do my live shows the stories that by far get the most response biggest laughs biggest applause um, it, are the stories about Desolation Sound, like me 
as a little kid showing up with my conservative family to a hippie nude potluck. Right. You know, uh, just stuff like that. People just, they eat it up. They, they love, and maybe it's the beachcombers syndrome, you know, they just, these coastal stories. Right. So that adventures in solitude book just keeps having legs. So right now we're working on a children's picture book version awesome. of adventures in solitude for kids to come out in uh, the fall. And there's another person that has recently contacted me, some other production company that is interested in some sort of treatment, who knows what that means or whether it'll go anywhere. But, uh, but other than that kid's book, I don't have any other writing on the go right now. I can tell you that I am absolutely loving the new no means no book that was just released by Jason lamb, the oral history of no means no, uh, from obscurity to oblivion. It's one of the mm -hmm. greatest rock and roll books I've ever read. Uh, and I read a lot of them. Um, so th there, there's an endorsement for that, but yeah, so that's what I am doing now. I'm working on this kid's book uh, back and forth with Harbor and doing the kid's book is fun because you, you work with an illustrator. Yeah. So, you have to edit yourself. You don't have to describe every bird and every animal that the kids see because the illustrator is going to draw those birds and animals. So that's a really cool thing to be working through. You've got a bunch of records on, on the back of your wall uh, while we're keeping yeah. the music. Can you reach behind you? Just pull a random one out. Tell me a story about it. And then we'll, uh, we'll let you go and get back to uh, being All a dad. Right. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm not, I'm just supposed to pull random. Just pull around something that's, uh, well, you know, I'm sure you know where they all are, but pull me something that's got okay. a story. All right. Um, well, this one actually has weird, this one goes back to, wow. um, do you, do you recognize this? I do recognize that record. Um, but, uh, oh, this is the double, the, where are they going? Yeah. Do, 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 do. The soundtrack of our lives. Right. Um, so this is an amazing Swedish band that uh, were that came around um, when the I guess actually Richards and Richards must have existed into the two thousands because uh, looping back to Richards on Richards, I saw this incredible band, the soundtrack of our lives, play at Richards on Richards. And they were this amazing kind of 60s, 70s, 80s style rock band where the guys, these Swedish guys were just, the, the lead singer was kind of this weird sort of Svengali, Brian Wilson type dude with a beard and a big robe on. And then the, the guitarists and bassists were these animated guys who would hold up their basses and guitars and pretend they were machine guns and stuff like super cheesy rock moves, but awesome, awesome songs. And they were part of the Swedish wave of the early two thousands mm. that included the that hives nice, yeah. Yeah. and the Sarah hot nights and international noise conspiracy. But this band was obsessed with the guess who and Bachman Turner overdrive Crazy. and, and Randy Bachman. So when they were coming to Vancouver, they got in touch with Randy Bachman and Randy Bachman went down to the show at Richards. And at a certain point in the show, Randy Bachman got up on stage and they proceeded to do like in with total earnestness, like five of Randy's biggest hits no in a row. <laughs> and for these guys, it was like, the greatest thing that had ever happened to them. And, you know, by that point, like Vancouverites maybe were a little burnt on, you know, like we obviously grew up hearing those songs a million times um, throughout our entire life. But seeing these five Swedish rockers have such a deep appreciation for Randy Bachman and his songs and to have Randy up there singing lead with these Swedish young Swedish guys backing him up, the entire audience went absolutely crazy 
And it was another amazing experience on Richards on Richards around, I love that. I love I'd say that around 2001, 2002. I love that so there cover. You go. I, I definitely recognize that recognize that cover, but I just haven't. I, I uh, and I, I know the name of the band. I've just never seen it. So uh, a great that's, a great, name. that's a great the story. soundtrack of our lives. Where yeah. can people find you online, Grant? GrantLawrence.ca. Um, Twitter sometimes, but usually only to see what people are saying about the Canucks, and um, and to rile up Theron Flurry. Every once in a while. It was on Instagram that Theo and I would go back and forth. Uh, yeah, I'm on Instagram too. You know, all those places, you know, all the usual places. And I always usually respond. But yeah, my, my site is grantlawrence.ca. That's where you can get tickets to any of my shows around BC. And um, I really appreciate the time, Brenton. I really appreciate the questions and the research and all the graphics and the ticker on the bottom. And this is uh, this is highfalutin. Hey, it's a story of people, man, and uh, I I love a, a great story. We could do probably three hours, and I I want to I'm gonna come back and we're gonna do a I'm gonna get you and I'm gonna get Aaron Chapman and we'll do a story of Canada thing because I think between the two of you uh, we can get into some pretty heavy uh, stuff about just the importance of what we've done for the rest of the world and uh, that would be and, awesome and and some of the things that you've done and then people can catch you of course on the cbc top 20 uh, yep. uh tell us when they can hear that is that that's it looks like thursdays between six and seven and sundays five to six yeah yeah that, that's on three times a week uh cbc music radio one uh, but easiest way to do it is cbc listen where you can listen at your convenience anytime so uh, I'm, I'm kind of over appointment listening. I don't even bother telling people. Actually, my bosses will be upset. Okay, fine. It's on Thursdays at 6, Sundays at 5, Wednesdays at 2. There you go. Wednesdays uh, at 3. Final yeah. question. Did you ever meet Bruno Garusi? No, I never met Bruno Garusi. The only cast member I've met is, is Jackson, Jackson Davis. Davis. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, we started this thing very Canadian, talking minor hockey. We ended yeah. this thing very Canadian, again, talking Beachcombers and Randy Bachman. Uh, very important conversation for me. You're talking about the pieces of art that you've put out. This is one of my favorite episodes I've done. I really oh, appreciate wow. the time. I really do, Grant. I, I really appreciate the time. I love uh, I'm a, uh, I, the history of this country and the people that appreciate what we've, uh, what we've put out to the world, plus uh, just – um, recognizing that the CBC is a, a, a core uh, ingredient to the makeup of who we are and uh, the people involved in it. So thank you. I really, okay. really, really, really appreciate it, buddy. It's great. Well, so. thank you very much, Brenton, for all your kind words and for your time today. That's Do Did Will, the Story of People podcast for another week, everybody. That's Grant Lawrence. Check him out. Buy the books. And if you're a writer, a movie maker, give him a treatment. <laughs> Make sure it involves Jackson Davies. But just make sure that he's it's not you know, he's not blowing up things and robbing yeah, banks. Yeah. Maybe maybe add a seal or two and an ice hockey game. That's right. Thanks, Grant. <laughs>